My question for the panel is how do we further develop a culture of compromise among leaders, whether in the public or private sector, whether in the United States or abroad? Um, Larkin, you were talking very, very articulately about the importance of having a middle ground, that it doesn't have to be black or white. And Solutions with Land has some good examples of win-win solutions. I guess my question is when there actually are trade-offs, how can each of us say, you know, I'm not going to get everything I want today, but if I can get, you know, half a loaf really being better than none, it, are there examples maybe the panel can come up with where, you know, I didn't win all I wanted, but you know, we got a pretty good deal, you got a pretty good deal, uh, because we do need farming and sustainable farming to produce, you know, 70 percent more food by 2050. And it's not just 2050. Globally, there are nearly a billion people who go to bed hungry tonight. I mean, we need solutions today on feeding people who aren't getting enough to eat. And you know, the leadership starts with things like solutions to land. And how do we help people compromise uh, in, in order to get those solutions? Thank you. Boy, am I waiting for the answer to this. AG? AG? Yeah, yeah, I'll get into this one, but I want to get the answer uh, for it. I'd like to really tell you a story that uh, has bothered me for years now. Uh, earlier I talked about the challenges when you have progressive young farmers that are, want to do, be early adopters or early adapters of new technologies. We had a dairyman in our uh, state in the San Joaquin Valley, a young fellow that had been very successful uh, in building a, a strong, uh, pr profitable uh, dairy business and he saw on his own that he wanted to move that next step of adaptation and, and early adoption of a digester, a dairy digester, and get himself off grid. He happened to have his dairy next to a natural gas line, which then he was able to negotiate a, a, a specific uh, agreement with the, uh, with the utility there that he could then invest out of his pocket into a dairy digester system that would allow him then to take his methane coming off of his farm uh, and take that uh, manure into a process that would yield uh, not only some good product for putting back on, the, on, the, on, on his farm, but the methane that could then be scrubbed and put into the natural gas line. We were all excited to watch this individual move this process forward. Uh, he ran into tremendous friction costs. Friction costs are those unexpected costs that the regulatory system or other people will throw in your way as you're trying to do an investment of this sort. What was challenging, though, he kept on putting money into this project because he believed that this is where he wanted to go as an early adapter, early adopter. Uh, and ultimately, as he came online and started to actually produce methane that was being scrubbed and put into the natural gas line, a regulatory agency came and said, your methane scrubber, which was run out of a diesel engine, is emitting too much NOx. Uh, we have no choice but to shut you down because you're emitting too much NOx out of that engine, and he, they shut the project down. Now, in that case, there was no observation of net benefit, and in defense of the regulatory agency at the time, that regulatory agency did not have options to be flexible, did not have an alignment of what their priorities were, which would have been air quality uh, in the general sense, uh, whether it's an ozone, whether it's uh, emissions of carbon uh, products. They didn't have that flexibility within the regulatory system, so there was no alignment of goals with what we were trying to accomplish. They shut that project down long enough and now there was no revenue coming in out of this huge investment for methane, uh, for methane digester. The milk market collapsed in the meantime, and this young dairyman's revenue source was shut off as well. He had payments. He was losing money every day, uh, just feeding his cows. He had no monies coming in from what would have been an advantage that he could have built in by having his side off-grid with his own energy system, and he went out of business, and they sold his dairy farm on the block. And I felt so responsible, all of us that were part of the government system that didn't come to, to realize that here's a guy that was creating a, a tremendous opportunity for dairy folks around the world to emulate, and yet we couldn't figure that out because we couldn't remove quickly enough, we couldn't be nimble enough to make flexibility within our regulatory system to enhance and, and look for success, imperfect as it might have been, in, in changing an entire 
way of we looking at waste and turning it into energy. So we're, 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 what we're looking at with solutions from the land, what we're looking at with the way this whole next century has to go is flexibility, nimbleness, the observation that compromise is something that we all will work towards because that means we're moving forward, not backwards. And that, that's why we, we have to see that this dialogue that's moving forward is to identify those areas, those, those, those problem areas that we just uh, have the capacity to change and by small changes really move everything into a different direction. And, and I, I, I can only say that the quicker we move into these areas of conflict to try and get to some new consensus or new evolution of regulatory zeal, because uh, it's okay to be, have zeal and, and good intentions of where we all want to move and what we want to do, but let's find the re resources and the solutions to make that happen. Just add, and this is a very general statement, but if you have a, a group or a point of view that has a goal, national on the global stage, that may be national food security at a national level or something like that, um, or let's take the one I've already waded into, which is conventional farming versus agriculture, and, and you have a, a mindset about it has to be this way, and, or, and the has to be this way is the problem. If you have the goal, which is economically, uh, for conventional agriculture, economically viable system that I can continue to operate on a daily basis and, and evolve in a, in a manageable fashion and improve and, and be viable economically. And the organic system, which is, um, I presume, about safely producing without, with minimizing inputs, much safe food for consumption and and for no uh, minimal or no footprint for the surrounding lands. I, I pr those are the goals that I've always assumed about organic production. You have those goals and you both look for progress instead of perfection. And that's where, and, and if the goal is progress and if progress towards minimizing inputs is made and progress towards minimizing inputs is made and, and this, in the scenario that I'm talking about, both of those lend to compromise and a blending of, of goals. So at a national level, and I, I think it was mentioned in my introduction, this past year I traveled to Turkey and Kenya on an Eisenhower Fellowship, specifically looking at the, asking questions about productivity and agriculture in those two very different nations, different from us and different from one another. One of the topics I always inquired about at the government level and at the sort of farmer level was GMOs. Turkey has taken the EU position and, and forbids them. It's put their, livestock industry in a big problem because they're importers of grains to feed their livestock and the, most of the grains traded on the world stage are commingled and that's going to involve GMO and they, they don't really, they haven't solved that yet and there are problems for that. Kenya's debating the policy and they've got huge influencers with different points of view trying to, and of course they had election on Monday so I'm interested to see how that comes out. But the debate, as you acknowledge, is profound around the world and if we, the debate can be about progress and about safe food versus a perfection of somebody's ideal of how to, how, what safe food, if, if it's science-based, about residues and about runoffs and about all the other things that, that are safe or less safe in production practices versus opinion-based or philosophy-based, and you make progress, that would be my general answer. <laughs>